Hey guys, I'm Sun. I'm a privacy and a security researcher and you're watching The Privacy Guides. Whew, I haven't created an episode in such a long time, so I kind of want to give you guys a status update first. I'll go through that really quickly and then I'm going to dive into today's episode, which is about why I don't use or trust uh, Google Drive, Dropbox or the like for my backups and how we can go about backing up data to the cloud privately. Uh, but before I get there, one of the reasons why I haven't published in a while is uh, one of you guys, someone that watches the Privacy Guides, reached out and that person is organizing at TEDx uh, in India. So that person, I'm probably going to mess up the name, so I'm so, so sorry about this. Uh, the person is Meg Megha. Oh, Jesus. Please, please let me know how to say this. <sighs> so that person is really lovely. That person reached out and said, hey, son, I like what you're doing on the Privacy Guides. I would like to invite you as a speaker for our TED and it's an in a, it's a university in India and yeah so obviously this is going to be a remote talk um, but yeah giving talks is something that really scares the shit out of me this what I'm doing here at the camera um, that is how my mind is wired it's mostly improvised I have a little screen right here which has kind of the idea for the episode and then everything else is improvised where a TED is usually scripted so it's not in my zone of comfort and I actually had a bunch of client work which is the reason number two why I haven't been publishing on YouTube for about a month so I had to plow through contract work by the way um, more on this in a behind the scenes but I'm actually refusing sponsorships for this channel because I want this content to be authentic and I actually don't want to be influenced by having to earn money on this. So that why, that's why I have to do client work on the side. So challenging myself with the TED Talk, doing client work, being super overwhelmed, almost dropping it, being really encouraged to push through by the TED uh, team and yeah. And then number three is I've been doing a whole bunch of research and I have some super exciting content for you guys coming. And as usual, when I start pushing content, usually I just plow through a bunch of content and put a few episodes up. So stay tuned. Whew. Man, it feels good to be back. Okay, so about today's episode, why I don't use Drive, Dropbox and the like for my backups. Actually, if I go back a few years, I actually loved, loved Dropbox. And their Freeman model where you used to get two gigs and if you invited people or if you did a few shenanigans like upload pictures to it and try different features, you could get additional uh, storage. So I ended up having like about 22 gigabytes of free storage and that was really cool and I super duper liked the idea of being able to put all my pictures on Dropbox and then take my smartphone and look at them on the phone and share some of them. I mean, the whole platform was really convenient. I actually have a small open source project, I'll link it in the description, that allows to upload files from a server to Dropbox. And the one feature that I've always liked is versioning. So when you upload a file and then you upload another version of the file, well, for 30 days, you get to go through all of the different versions. Um, I won't dive into this into great detail, but that's actually super useful for server backups because you can actually encrypt a backup using uh, PGP or GNUPG and then upload that to Dropbox and each backup will be like pretty huge. Uh, but if you do it, you know, it doesn't account for additional storage because it keeps 30 days of the same file. So you can dump like a one gigabyte file and have 30 versions of it. So that's super useful. So I'm not challenging at all the fact that Drive and Dropbox and the like are super useful. Those are very convenient tools. They're now really much part of our everyday when we do collaborative work on the internet. That being said, there are a few caveats here that I wanna address today. Number one is there are a few terms that are thrown to us, thrown at us uh, all the time when we look at you know how things work from a security and privacy standpoint. Uh, one of those are uh, in-transit encryption. Actually, let's take a step back. Encryption in general. Most, most technologies now will tell us that our data is encrypted. And that is designed to make us feel good about using a specific product. But now there really are three different types of encryption and they're so very different. One of those are, is, is called in-transit encryption. So when you go on your bank website and you're on an HTTPS website, that website 
is in like the, the, the communication between your, your browser and the server of your bank, that's encrypted. That's called in transit encryption. That means that your browser establishes a cryptographic handshake with the server, shares a bunch of keys, uh, and once those keys are shared, all of the information between you, so the browser and that server is encrypted. That's in transit encryption. That doesn't mean that the data is encrypted on the server or, yeah, more of this in a second, actually. Now, the other thing that people, you know, tend to mention is at rest encryption. What at rest encryption means is that means that the data is encrypted on the server. So not only is it encrypted in transit, but it's then encrypted at rest on the server. Now, does that mean that our data is private, that only us can access it? Well, no. The reason is it's encrypted using keys that are owned by the provider. The reason why they do this is because they want to mitigate data uh, exfiltration. They don't want a hacker or a rogue employee to be able to you know, take a hard drive and then sell it on the black market or stuff like this. So they, they're essentially protecting their own infrastructure. And that's really, uh, it, it, it's something that operates at the security level. It makes it secure. Like I'm not challenging the fact that, you know, Drive or Dropbox are secure. I'm pretty sure they are secure, but are they private? No, because the provider has keys to the file. So when we upload all of this very, you know, personal stuff, all those files that we used to have on external hard drives and on our computers, when we upload those to the cloud, it's essentially like if we're putting them there at the provider and that provider can actually access the data. Now, they probably won't. They probably have a whole bunch of governance systems into place, but they can. And that's something that I'm really uncomfortable with. And that brings me to the last one, which is called end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, that is what I really am looking for when I'm, you know, is, uh, evaluating different technology uh, systems. Like when I, I've discussed this in the context of Signal. So when you use Signal messaging, the message is encrypted on our device and then, and it's encrypted with the public key of the recipient and then the message is sent to the recipient and then they decrypt it on their device and to end encryption. Now the same logic could apply to cloud uh, you know, storage. A file can be encrypted on our devices and then stored on the cloud encrypted. And by the way, that will also benefit if it's well implemented from in transit and at rest encryption. But that means that the provider is providing infrastructure to store files, but they're not providing it in a way that allows them to see what we're uploading. Now that is really what gets me excited. And that in the context of sharing files, it makes things much harder. Uh, so when you're sharing things, both parties have to have access to the encryption key so that they can then decrypt it. That means something that is kind of unfortunate. It means that doing real-time collaborative tech that would be end-to-end -end encrypted is extremely challenging and that's probably why there is very little of that or none. I know that there are a few enterprise providers that have like Dropbox equivalents that support end-to-end -end encryption and file sharing. More on that perhaps in a future episode. But yeah, back to today's episode. Um, there is one really simple test that you guys can do if you're questioning if something, like if a, if a cloud file storage provider supports end-to-end -end or not. If it's possible to access the files and preview them in the browser, as you probably do all the time uh, on Dropbox or Drive, well, that means that it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. A browser is just not capable of efficiently decrypting files. The reason why it works in the context of ProtonMail, for instance, so in the context of mail, is that ProtonMail is able to decipher uh, information using OpenPGP in the browser. Now, to be quite honest, I have never tried decrypting an attachment in ProtonMail. 
And that's something that I should have researched before creating this episode, damn it. But anyways, the idea is there. You just can't decrypt huge amounts of information in the browser. Perhaps it's possible using OpenPGP, but that's like a whole other story. The thing is most providers that do support uh, end-to-end file storage in the cloud will only allow accessing the information from an actual computer or like a native app running on Mac or running on you know iOS or equivalent Windows, Android, blah, blah, blah. Now, the other problem with end-to-end encryption is uh, it's a legal problem. It's what happens if a user forgets his or her password, and that happens all the time. Well, if the data is actually encrypted on the server using, you know, a key derived from the password of the user, if the user forgets his password, well, he or she will never be able to access the information again. So I'm guessing that that's something that huge providers such as Google or Dropbox are pretty worried about. They don't want users to kind of sue them because they lost access to their data or stuff like this. Okay, looking at my notes to make sure I don't forget something, Jesus. Um, yeah, so, so all of this said, Dropbox and Drive and alike do not support end-to-end encryption. They're often marketed as secure. They often marketed as the data is encrypted. Well, it's encrypted, but it's not encrypted in a way that makes it private. It's encrypted in a way that makes it secure. So there's a huge difference between private and secure. And that being said, there are options. So I have an episode that is all ready to go and that I will be sharing in the near future on how to use Borg to do backups to a server that we control. It's a way of self-hosting our own server version of Borg so that we can then back up files from our Macs to Borg using something called deduplication. So remember when I said that I really love the fact that, you know, using Dropbox, you can have different versions of the same file. Well, obviously, and I also mentioned that when you upload a file that's say a gigabyte and you upload it every day and you have 30 days of versioning of it, well, Dropbox doesn't store a whole copy of the full file each time. Not sure if you guys have watched the episode on how to back things up and encrypt things using Veracrypt. I'll link that in the description. But the way that was set up, we were actually creating multiple copies of the same file. That's cool because it's like really low level, not much abstractions going on there, but it's totally inefficient when it comes to uploading you know, new versions of a file to the cloud. You don't want to re-upload the whole file because that's huge. And you don't want to store the whole file because that's huge. You want to update the delta, what has changed. And if something that has changed, say you have twice the same file in two separate folders, well, you don't want to re-upload the whole file twice. You want to have one copy of the file and then have some abstraction that says that it's present in two different paths. That is what we call deduplication. And Borg Backup supports deduplication. It supports end-to-end encryption. And it's a pretty, pretty awesome open source project. So I have a great episode coming your way really shortly. But I just wanted to kind of give you guys a bit of context of why all of this matters, why using something like Borg matters, why we do have to trade a little bit of convenience uh, and maybe I'll get to actually discussing about, uh, you know, discussing cloud uh, providers that allow users to share files amongst them. That's something that I've been asked many times. That's something that's super useful when we use this in the context of a company, for instance. Uh, yeah, but more on that in the future. If you have ideas, by the way, please drop them in the comments. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you today. I'll be back really shortly. I have a huge list of content, like. I don't even know how, how I'm going to actually go about creating all this, but yeah, th- thanks. Thanks for watching and, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.